Good morning. So I'm John Sagers. I'm a developer with the Office Envisioning team at Microsoft. And this is Alex Bennett, uh, who's a designer on the group. Our team's job is to look ahead and explore the future of work. What are the big shifts and trends that will affect us, and what do we think everyday uh, productivity scenarios will look like in the next five to 10 years? We do this work by conducting research with industry experts and partner companies, and by building live experience prototypes. Along with our partners, uh, teams in engineering, uh, we build those at a 4,000 square foot space. And every two to three years, we make a vision video. Uh, and you saw uh, bits of our latest vision video in that, uh, in that show reel. If you want to see the video, whole video, I have it linked on my blog. So we use that 4,000 square foot space that John mentions called the Envisioning Center in a number of different ways. The Envisioning Center acts as a stage for our various demos that we've created. The physicality of the space allows us to invite both internal Microsoft Teams and external companies to come into the space, experience these demos with us, which creates a dialogue around our long-term vision. They learn from us just as much as we learn from them. The Envisioning Center acts as the equivalent of a concept car for Microsoft. These demos that we create are made up of software and hardware prototypes situated in a variety of different environments, showcasing numerous collaboration and individual scenarios. We created three different environments, the future workplace, on-the-go productivity, and the home of the future. We string all these environments and scenarios together with an overarching story. We are strong believers in the power of storytelling. Story is the oldest and most powerful tool we use as humans. It allows us to imagine, to provoke, and to connect. Storytelling in the Envisioning Center allows us to not only provide context to the demos, but add a sense of why. Stories build the foundation that articulates why various interactions, experiences, are important and worthwhile. So our team sees the future of work trending towards three pillars of collaboration, intelligence, and creative flow. And that the way to support this is creating tools for thinking. We think we're going to need to collaborate with more people across more boundaries and solve, uh, to solve tomorrow's challenges. So we'll need tools and environments that help us understand one another, come together, and work together in, in much better ways. Attention is the new scarce resource. So we need intelligent tools that understand our context, bring the right data to us at the moment of need, and it help us extract meaning from the flood of information. So we can focus on the things that matter and make the most of every moment. With more and more routine work largely automated, the nature of our work will have to change to emphasize creative work, work that involves human judgment, decision making, and creation. We will need tools and environments that let us work naturally and spontaneously, the way our minds work, but at the same time augment our natural human abilities with tremendous analytical power of machines. This will need to be done intuitively, allowing us to interact naturally on our own terms, with a seamless mobility of experience across devices and locations. You can think of this as creative flow. Now, we could give a whole talk on that, but we're here to talk about how we build the demos and how Unity helps us with that. Uh, so we're going to talk about the process, workflow, tools, and strategies that we used and that you can use when exploring new concepts and ideas. We're going to cover a number of topics in this talk. We'll start by talking about the overall design process that drives our creative endeavors. Then about how Unity can bring other tools together for rapid prototyping. We'll discuss the challenges presented by using the Unity UI system as a primary user experience and how we extended Unity's multi-touch handling to alleviate some of them. And we'll talk about ways to use Unity networking with a UI-heavy application. The Envisioning team is a design-led team. We partner with product teams across the company like Skype, HoloLens, Surface Hub, Office, et cetera, which help us maintain a general trajectory of where these products are and where they might be going. But ultimately, we push beyond that, and we try not to limit ourselves by the current engineering realities. Our design team covers a broad spectrum of design disciplines, from strong visual designers to user experience designers to hardware and software prototyping. Our design process starts with insights from talking to thought leaders on the future of productivity and manifests itself through quick brainstorming, sketching, and prototyping. 
we take these system, we take a design system, we take a systems thinking approach to design, not bound by the current paradigms of Office and Windows as they are today. We create a UI system that scales across a lot of different devices and scenarios that we placed inside the Envisioning Center. Our team worked for months on creating a UX model that's centered around two primary elements, the stream and the canvas. The stream is a scrolling list of tiles that aggregates content across apps, my environment, and the people in my life. It's contextually based on location, calendar, and my needs across both work and my personal life. It's curated by Cortana and doesn't show me everything but what's relevant now in my current context. This allows me to stay on top of what's the most important without drowning in an endless river of updates and alerts from all over. The canvas, on the other hand, allows us to access multiple types of content on a single surface, as well as the people around me that I need to get projects done. Content and people are the focus here, with apps broken down into their component parts, and their tools at my fingertips only available when I need them. To flesh out these uh, ideas on the design side, we're using powerful prototyping tools like Framer to Go quickly to the uh, demo machine, first demo machine. Yeah. So to um, quickly flesh out these ideas on the design side, we're using powerful tools like Framer to quickly iterate through 2D interactions and concepts. Let me walk you through a set of prototypes that we created to explore this idea. These prototypes are uh, usually stay in sort of a rough wireframe-like aesthetic until we sort of nail down the desired functionality and feel. So I mentioned when exploring the canvas of breaking apps down to their component parts and having this idea of what we call tools at your fingertips and to manipulate content. So sure, awesome. <laughs> um, so what I'll show you um, is sort of a, you know, not a finished pr uh, prototype, but sort of a snapshot in time to sort of walk you through the iteration process that we have. So how can you have tools contextually appear at your fingertips? So I'm going to press and hold inside the canvas. So I will press and hold inside the canvas. And then these tools pop up. And I can sort of access different tools and people. And if I want a larger set, then I would scroll over to the side. So at first, we started riffing off of radial menus and exploring how you can press and hold keep that there, uh, anywhere. And, um, and then tools and actions appear at your fingertips. But if AI didn't pick up what you wanted um, when you press and hold, how could you sort of allow um, for more items to show up um, and because we found that this was a little too simplistic. So we moved over to the next prototype, where you press and hold, and four items would pop up. And then as you sort of scroll down, more items, more tools would appear. Um, so it would be a way of you to sort of naturally um, expose the amount of tools that you wanted. Um, and we thought this was a little more interesting, but still wasn't exactly nailing what we wanted. And then you could slide left to right to explore people or other tools. Um, so we use this thinking by building process, uh, and that led us to our last prototype that I'll show you. By no means a final solution, but it illustrates our process, um, where we took the best of the first two prototypes and put them together, as well as adding one more element. We love the idea from the first prototype that um, the tools were quickly available when you needed them, but instead of just creating a long random list of tools after that, the next available tools were chunked into categories uh, so that you could scan before you pan down, and then you could then see an entire category bar. So I'll pull that up. So these prototypes act as for us a way to quickly iterate. And because Framer is just a JavaScript framework, we were able to uh, bring this into Unity as well using a plugin that John will talk about later called Coherent. We think that Unity is a fantastic tool in and of itself, um, but can also act as the ultimate aggregator. We work by quickly blend blending little JavaScript prototypes with larger native Unity components. For more robust features and functionality, uh, we want them baked back straight into slides. Unity. Yep, so if we go back to the main slide, the PowerPoint. Can we switch back to that? Yep, there we go. Awesome, cool. Yeah, so for ro more robust features and functionality, we wanted them baked straight into Unity. So we, bought the, we brought those ideas fully into reality by creating high fidelity uh, static and motion specs that encapsulated the vision that we had in our heads and sketchbooks. We turned sticky notes and sketches into Illustrator artboards and motion specs, which you saw in the opening video. Then these could hand, be handed to John and created more fully in Unity. So the designer team did not have experience with Unity, but they had a lot of experience working with Illustrator, After Effects, and other tools. 
These are the tools that they use to think and create. As we started this process, they looked for somebody who shared their design aesthetics and who was also experienced in Unity. Uh, perhaps if we'd had more time, we might have found somebody. <clears throat> Instead, as Alex described, after many iterations, we had a set of artifacts, uh, including motion study videos, which formed a visual kinetic spec. Meanwhile, I was building out the interactive framework in Unity on which we would hang these images and animations. I was trying to hit a moving target. Continuous iteration uh, amongst the designers meant that there were several things that I built that didn't really match up with the final designs. This is an area where tighter coordination between the, the groups may have helped. Now, this is a good time to show a quick demo. Uh, can we go to the uh, stage right? So this was going to be a network demo, uh, running this with my phone. Um, and uh, go, go ahead and let Alex uh, talk about the, uh, the lead into this. Cool. So the Envisioning Center is our UI playground, where we get to sort of push the boundaries of modern UI, motion, and interaction. Uh, the stream allows us to experiment with different ways of displaying and animating actionable and useful information. Uh, and tiles are packaged up and so that you can uh, you know, uh, take actionable content from that stream. So um, what we can see here on the, um, actually, you can't see because we've already switched over. <laughs> uh, sorry. Actually, if you could switch back to the, the slide deck for just a moment. So this is our, our cafe uh, set up in the Envisioning Center. Uh, we have a 4K monitor on the side there that uh, displays a mirror of what's on the phone. Uh, the uh, Nokia Lumia uh, 950XL is a pretty powerful device. Um, it's a high-resolution screen, but it's not 4K, and it doesn't have the oomph to drive 4K, nor could we get 4K across Wi-Fi um, to that display. So instead, go ahead and switch back to stage right uh, demo. Um, we had a single project built as a standalone to drive the 4K monitor and built as a universal Windows application to drive it on the, on the phone. The um, so I'm going to be driving the whole thing just here in, in Unity uh, on the screen since uh, we couldn't get the Wi-Fi to, to play nicely with us today. <laughs> um, so start here. Uh, so this is the, the stream. Um, and Alex. So. Um, so this is just a, a standard uh, Unity scroll rect. Um, as I drag down, I'm actually changing. Uh, when I detect it uh, scrolling down off the top there, I bring in this other uh, piece of content, adding it into the scroll so that it's uh, just scrolling nicely. Hit this, uh, the bottom, same thing happens on the bottom. Uh, so it gives you past and future context to your stream. Um, here we've just walked up to the cafe. And uh, we can order our usual, uh, usual drink and such. Um, we also have other things that can expand in here, uh, go in and uh, adjust a, uh, adjust a, a, an expense report there. Um, so a lot of stuff in here. We've got a lot of different kinds of, act of uh, data being displayed here, things that would uh, come from multiple different apps. Um, but when we have multiple kinds of information, or the same kinds of information in multiple places, we want to have the, uh, the formats be similar. And so for that, I created a, a method where we would use uh, Unity prefabs for doing the, the formatting and layout and animations involved, but then have a set of template files uh, data in XML that will uh, actually populate those with, uh, with the strings and the image references uh, at runtime. So uh, if I dive into the stuff here, this is that scroll rect 
This is the stuff in that past area. This is the main, the main content down here. All of these are simply instantiated prefabs. They did not exist in the scene to begin with. Um, but they are, each, of, each one of them is a marriage between uh, the, the Unity prefab and the data that is more easily editable. Um, and uh, a little bit later, I'll go in and, and show you uh, some of the code behind this and some of the XML and such. Um, so if we could switch back to the slides. Um, so our team did not include anyone with te Unity technical art skills. Uh, fortunately, we found a couple of freelancers who worked alongside us uh, to convert the animations and layouts from the visual spec into the Unity animations and code. One critical aspect here, I built most of these demos relying heavily on the uh, Unity's new uh, UGUI Canvas framework. The REC transform layout mechanisms are quite powerful, uh, but also rather unfamiliar to a lot of technical artists. There is a steep learning curve, and it's easy to create prefabs that look perfect for one set of content, but don't scale well or animate well. A prime example that caught us more than once was the difference between sprite renderer and image. Sprite renderer is a normal transform-based uh, component that is drawn by the camera during normal scene rendering. Image is a rec transform based component that also draws sprites, um, but it's drawn during the canvas rendering phase uh, of the UI. If you try and mix sprite renderers and UGUI, it's a good way to go crazy. Just as we iterated the uh, visual spec, the entire design team iterated on the actual demos themselves. Something that may look great in a video might not actually feel right when you're actually using the product. So story elements were also changed, and new artwork was found that better worked to tell the story. Lastly, late in the game, uh, we created different design uh, video assets for the demos. This required script, actors, and auto video recording equipment. One of the benefits of using the uh, Universal Windows build on a Windows phone was that we were able to use Unity's uh, movie texture on the phone. This isn't supported by the other phone platforms. Uh, the phone can't handle the same bit rates and resolutions as a PC that was driving the 4K display, but selecting different video streams uh, on, based on the uh, device target is pretty easy. And this allowed us to use videos as pieces of the UI, simply attaching movie texture uh, to raw image objects in the, in the UI. Uh, prototyping is great for getting ideas into an interactive form quickly, but not so much if you have to master new tools first. Unity can use the output of external tools in various ways. HTML is a good tool uh, for doing traditional text and graphic 2D layout. Uh, there's a lot of tools which graphic designers can use to create that layout. You just need a good way to display it in Unity. Um, Coherent Labs has some great tools for this. I'm using Coherent GT uh, in my framework for showing documents as things that I can move around on a canvas. Um, I can even display things, for example, from Office Online. Um, AI to HTML is a tool that was originally created by the New York Times, uh, which converts Adobe Illustrator artboards into HTML. Um, and then Framer.js, which Alex was demoing earlier, um, is promising. It has a few issues that I haven't been able to work around um, at this time. So as I've mentioned before, video can be a good shortcut. You can use stock video, pre-rendered sequences out of After Effects, uh, et cetera. Um, however, you do need to be aware of the platform limitations. Standalone builds and Universal Windows Platform lets you use uh, the movie texture. Um, the video format that Unity requires is uh, Og Theor of Orbis, or OGV. Uh, if you place a video format other than this in the project, then Unity will import it, uh, converting it into OGV using its parameters. 
Uh, if you load the project on another machine or have to rebuild your library directory, then you have to re-import all those videos. Um, if you manually convert to OGV, uh, this gives you control over the conversion process, um, the quality, frame rate, et cetera. FFmpeg is a command line utility that gives you precise control over a lot of things you may not have even known existed. <laughs> Uh, manually converting also lets you place the video in streaming assets. Uh, there are a couple of things to watch out for when doing these conversions. One is uh, be sure that the pixel format is YUV 420p. Um, I had a piece of video that was the source was YUV 422p, which is just a different way of uh, encoding the chroma. And that caused a color ghosting effect where the, the, there was the, uh, the, the grayscale was correct, and then the cyan and magenta were shifted vertically uh, off of that, um, change, using FFmpeg to transcode that back to uh, 420 uh, got rid of that problem. Uh, use the, the libtheora encoder uh, and use the Qscale video parameters to specify quality. Uh, watch your bit rate. Um, one of the, the videos in that stream is of a panning across a, um, a hydroponics uh, greenhouse. It's got a lot of vertical stripes in it. Whereas most, at the rate that I was using for all the videos uh, at the 4K side, most of them were sitting at around four megabits per second. That one came in at over 20 megabits per second and would drag the, the performance down to a crawl. Uh, it actually made the, uh, the editor almost unusable. <laughs> um, so use that Qscale parameter to get the bit rate under control uh, to something that works with your, uh, with your use scenario. Um, you can pause the video when the object that's displaying it is no longer visible. Either it's been a, occluded by something or scrolled off, uh, and this lightens the load on the GPU. So in all things you want to show off are in software. Uh, and sometimes you want to demonstrate things that don't quite exist yet. Uh, we create various Arduino prototypes and communicate with Unity via a serial COM port uh, using either USB or Bluetooth. Now, if you need to access APIs that, are, that Unity and Mono don't yet support, there are workarounds. Uh, accessing the Universal Windows API from a UWP build target, obviously, can be done um, as shown in the Unity uh, plugins project at the URL there at the bottom. Um, and you can use that. Uh, that it provides uh, support for a number of different uh, categories in the, of the UWP API. Um, but you can extend it. One of the things that we were using in our demo was speech recognition. And uh, so I was able to uh, directly access the UWP uh, speech APIs uh, through that mechanism. Uh, something to be careful of there. The, read, read the notes at, on the, uh, the web page there. But you do need to uh, make one call in your app.cpp uh, file that um, sets up the interthread communications, because the UWP uh, side of things runs on the Windows application thread, and the Unity side needs to run for getting uh, data back and, and callbacks, needs to run on the, uh, the Unity thread. Um, and so at the end of the talk, I'll also show uh, how to access DLLs that reference later versions of .NET than are, are supported by Unity. Um, as we saw in the roadmap yesterday, Hopefully, that won't be needed much longer, but uh, because uh, they're bringing uh, C Sharp 6 and uh, .NET uh, 4.5.6 into, into Unity. But until then, uh, you can go ahead and uh, do this. Um, and I'll be doing an article about that on my blog uh, in the next couple of weeks. So touch is becoming a more and more important of modern UI. Uh, Unity's multi touch support is getting better, um, but it doesn't handle two or more hands very well. Uh, some of our demos, we actually use an 84-inch Surface Hub, uh, which is capable of tracking up to 100 fingers at a time. 
I tried using uh, various libraries that support multi-touch uh, gestures. Uh, for example, I uh, thought that TouchScript was going to work uh, well for me. Unfortunately, when I tried to mix TouchScript uh, with Unity's native support based on uh, controls such as the, you know, the scroll rect, there were just too many race conditions uh, because things are being done in parallel and you don't know which, uh, you know, should you re be responding to this TouchScript event or this, uh, this Unity event and the controls can't work from the TouchScript side. Um, fortunately, Unity published the, UI, uh, the, the Unity Engine.UI uh, library as an open source project on Bitbucket. With that, I crafted an extension to it which integrates multi-touch processing and ex uh, extensible gesture support into the same input pipeline as Unity's normal touch rendering. This allows stock Unity controls to respond to more than one person's interaction at a time. For example, uh, and actually, we were, yeah, we're going to go to another demo here. Sorry. Uh, right, stayed right. Uh, let me bring up the other project here. Uh, this one, I'm going to bring up a pre-built version. Um, sorry, I should have set this, brought this up beforehand. Um, let's see. So this is an early uh, set of work that on the, uh, the desk that we're doing. And this is um, not supposed to be running at this resolution. <laughs> um, let me, okay. Um, I can try and, and fix the resolution on this right now. Uh, let's not do that and let's just go ahead and uh, um, actually, wait a minute, let me, let me try something else. Um, See if uh, Unity is. There we go. Let's go to nineteen. Why does it not want to go to nineteen twenty? There we go. Awesome. Now we'll see. Okay. Huh. I Live demos are always an adventure. Yeah, see yeah. <laughs> this was working fine, but then they switched the resolution on the on it to uh but awesome. Okay, that's, so ignore the stream for a moment. <laughs> um, we'll just go ahead and run with it at the, because uh, uh, what's on the stream, you've already seen some of that from the cafe. Um, ah. Come on, Unity. Oh, there we go. Okay, so Alex is gonna just play with that up and down for a little bit. Um, well, meanwhile, I'm 
interacting with this control over here. This is just straight, uh, th this is a, uh, a, an image a raw image control over here that's displaying the hand. Uh, that's just a scroll rec over there. I've got multi-touch going on here. I can uh, actually go dive in here and interact with the, the content here. I can tap it again and Uh, come on. There we go. Get it back down in size. Um, note that as I, I'm panning this across the screen, it is, even though this is 3D content, it's being rendered by an off screen camera and then proxied onto the UI as a, as a uh, render target, a render texture. So this allows me to move it around on my virtual surface without it having parallax issues. Uh, that would make it otherwise rather untenable to use as a, as a workspace. Uh, but at the same time, as you saw, I was able to tap into it and directly manipulate the 3D object back there. That's because I'm taking the, uh, as it's going through and doing the raycast on the UI side, this object is, is transforming that into the coordinate system of the camera that's actually rendering this and doing a raycast out into there. So it gets incorporated into the same Raycast stream as everything else. Um, now, one of the important aspects here, uh, with Unity's normal touch input, if you have multi-touch and you have two fingers that are placed across something, Unity uses the centroid of those touch points as the action point. So if you've got your fingers placed on opposite sides of a button, Unity thinks you're pressing the button. So what I do here is I actually compute a spanning tree of the touch points and then treat those as clusters. If they stray too far from each other, now I have, I have two clusters. And even if they come back together, they will stay separate. This allows for, you know, the, you saw Alex uh, working with the stream on one side. I'm working with the other stuff on the other side. If you've got a, uh, a large display input device, you can have three or four people all interacting at the same time without conflicts. <coughs> um, Another thing that uh, we were talking about is the ability to drag something out of the stream and drop it onto the canvas. Now, if the network is happy with me, this should load a, um, an HTML page from Excel. But just like I was having issues with the internet uh, connecting locally to the phone, it looks like it's not going to bring up the, uh, the page for me there. Um, but uh, so, again, demo foo. <laughs> um, so let's uh, go on to the next. It is the okay. Uh, yep. uh, so if we go back to the slides now. So this multi-touch system is available as a fork of the Unity Engine uh, UI project on Bitbucket. Uh, and I have a post on my uh, blog on MSDN which describes it. Currently, it supports uh, Unity 5.3. Um, I'm just in the middle of uh, bringing that up to 5.4. Um, that, so that should be up in the next uh, day or two. I'm also pleased to be able to tell you that some future version of Unity, um, something after 5.5, will incorporate a version of this. Um, as I understand it, the gesture handling uh, may get moved uh, even deeper into the main engine, um, and we may see multi-touch support in the editor. That would be nice. Um, the Unity 5.5 beta uh, has modified the event system classes and the scroll rect uh, control so that they can be better derived from. Uh, there were a number of methods and fields that were private, and uh, they've uh, made those protected instead. 
So I'll be able to take my code and package it up as uh, entirely client-side code, and you won't have to build your own custom uh, uh, module for the Unity UI. Um, and that, again, I'll, we'll, I'll be doing that over the next week or so. So the, the UGUI system uh, can be used as a primary UI. It's not just for HUDs and menus. It does lack a few things in the handling of user interface events, however. The Unity event system is tailored for passing things like mouse clicks and uh, scrolling and drag and drop type stuff. Uh, you can use it for sending more uh, uh, semantic user events, such as follow this link or drag this out of a list. Uh, you, could, you can do that by creating uh, unique custom interfaces for each one of those. But that gets cumbersome very quickly. Um, instead, I've layered a UI event system on top of the, uh, the uh, Unity events, which allows one to use a single new interface to handle any number of semantic events uh, and have those defined by an enumeration uh, provided by the application. When an event is triggered or executed, it uses the Unity event uh, handler uh, to find the specific object uh, that can handle that interface. It then checks uh, for using uh, annotations to find a specific event handler method for that event if it exists. It can also query to find out whether that object is in a state in which it can handle that event. If either of those is false, then it will continue bubbling up until it finds something that can handle that. Uh, you can also register a, uh, you can register global listeners that don't need to be in that hierarchy in order to respond to the events. Um, and I'll be making that available on my, on my blog. And if you uh, switch back to the demo uh, stage right again, uh, let's actually go in and uh, show a little bit about how the code looks when we're dealing with that. So. Go to the version that uh, I've been working in here. So I'll expand this in just a moment, uh, make things a little bit easier to, to read. Um, so for the example, the, uh, so the event IDs are just a simple enumeration. Um, and um, basically, these are whatever your app needs to be able to do. The UI event is a class that wraps that and allows you to package up some additional code. Um, the, the UI event class is just this one down here. Um, and it associates an event along with uh, data, and this gets wrapped up into a, a wrapper class, which also uh, wraps together with it the, um, the object that's sending it and the event data stream that, that, gen that caused this to be generated. When we execute an event, um, and if I go down here and take, for example, a look at the, my uh, 
stream scroll rect. Um, so I have two event IDs set up that can be configured in the inspector that says, what event do I want to trigger when I either swipe left or swipe right? Um, so when I, when I swipe right out of the stream, that means I want to drag that thing out. So I have, have that set in Unity uh, in the inspector to say, uh, use the drag out of stream. And that gets, it'll bubble up from the, the object that um, was first hit, and so there is a stream drag handler. Um, if I can find it here. And of course, I'm not finding it here. Scroll, uh, scroll rock drag handler, here we go. Um, uh, that, that just does that, sorry. Um, let's do it this way. Come over here, drag item out of stream, and Uh, find usages, where is it? Oh, my ReSharper license uh, didn't talk to its server. <laughs> um, and I've got license on the mind. Okay, so anyway, the um, go to a different uh, one here. Scripts. So on the workspace controller here, this is re uh, registers itself as a global listener, and that's not the right one. Um, Oh, <laughs> of course, that's why. I'm in the wrong project. I should be looking at desk, not cafe. Hmm. Okay, so here's an example of some of the annotations where we have uh, just a simple annotation up here that says uh, when you get the, the now open event uh, uh, triggered, then do this code. Uh, this is handled entirely through reflection of uh, attributes and such, so you don't need to uh, do any other wiring behind the scenes. Um, so that's taken way too much time on that. Uh, let's go back to the slides, please. So there are a couple of ways to access assets by name. Uh, of course, you all know about uh, the resources directory, um, and then there's also the asset bundles. Accessing resources by name was imperative for me because of the uh, connection that I had between 
the XML-based data uh, that was used by non-developers to link up the data with the Unity prefabs. Um, but placing the, the sprites and things in the resources directory ends up uh, not allowing you to use atlases. Whereas if you place them in asset bundles, then you, those, the, they can be packaged up into atlases, and that is a significant performance win. And so it really is important, uh, you know, doing, doing that work to, to use the asset bundles is uh, well worth the effort. Um, you can also include asset bundles into streaming assets. This reduces the runtime complexities. There's no server required. Uh, you have guaranteed availability. It also means that you must manage them a bit on the build side of things. This is made much easier if you create menu commands in the editor to clear out all the old bundles and rebuild new ones. Uh, if you have sprites in your bundles, a manual build is actually a three-step process. You have to rebuild the, uh, the atlases for the current target, then uh, clear out and rebuild your asset bundles, and then run your build. And if you're doing a UWP build, there's a, another build step after that with Visual Studio. Um, creating a build script that does all of these steps automatically makes building much easier and it reduces human error. And when you're running in the, in the uh, editor, the asset bundle manager, uh, which I, I use the asset bundle manager that uh, is in the uh, asset bundle demo by, uh, by Unity. Um, the, the URL is uh, there on the slide there. Um, that can simulate the use of asset bundles so that it's using the live, uh, possibly very recently updated images and such that are in your assets um, so you don't have to worry about having stale asset bundles while you're working in the editor. Uh, implementing the networking solution for the CAFE demo led me down some dark passages of the Unity networking system. This system can work with the UI, but it wasn't designed for it. Uh, when you spawn a prefab, only the root of the prefab will get a network ID. Um, even if child objects have network identity components, they won't get set. This complicates matters when you want to parent a new object to a specific child of an existing object in the system, um, such as the placing something into the content of a scrolling view. The network transform is a Unity uh, networking component which communicates uh, transform changes throughout the connected systems. However, it doesn't work for rec transforms. Rec transforms must be children uh, in a hierarchy below a canvas object. But network transform must be a root object in the scene, a game object that doesn't have any parent. So I created workarounds for these. I created a network relative reference, uh, which is simply a data class that can be serialized, which identifies a child rec transform by giving a path from a parent that has a network ID. Um, and I created a network rec transform that works with a manager object to communicate the changes to values uh, that have changed in the network transform. So if, you'd been, if I had been, been able to show you the remote demo, uh, as I scrolled up and down on the phone, you would have seen it scrolling up and down uh, on the remote display. Um, and when you have an, an animator driving scrolling on both the server and the, the client, uh, but also need to be able to manually scroll that item, then things can get jumpy as they fight back and forth for positioning control. Uh, so I needed to be able to engage and disengage that network uh, controlled scrolling and do so without incurring race conditions. And so I came up with a semaphore system that could atomically change uh, states and wait for the proper states to change. I'll be dealing, detailing these solutions uh, in my blog over the next few weeks. So uh, in closing, 
Uh, know the story you're trying to tell. Uh, then think by making and iterate using the tools that you're comfortable with. Uh, and then allow Unity to bring those things together. Unity's uh, UI system can be a primary UI. Uh, take care of learning it, and it can be tamed. Multi-touch support is getting better over time, but you don't have to wait uh, to do some great stuff with it. And while Unity's uh, networking is designed around core gameplay, it can be used with the GUI system with care. Um, and we don't have time for any more code exploration. Um, thank you. Any questions? There's uh, microphones up here in the front if anybody has questions. And it looks like there aren't any. Cool. So, um, thanks so much. I actually, if, you, if folks want to, uh, I can show you a little snippet of code that allows you to have a uh, DLL as a plugin. That if you if you're trying to get access to um, .NET uh, 4.5 or something like that APIs or other Win32 APIs that you can't quite get to from Unity. Um, you have to go through kind of a two-stage step. You build a uh, plugin that Unity understands and put that in the plugins directory. That then needs to reference a, uh, the a DLL that does your actual API uh, manipulations that, is, that runs in a, uh, that is loaded only by, by that one. If you put that in plugins and Unity tries to, to look into it, it'll say, that's the wrong version of, uh, of .NET. I can't deal with it, and such. Problem with doing that is that, by default, the, uh, that second DLL has to reside, um, if you're, if, when you're running in the editor, and even just to, to run in the editor when you've got a system like this, it needs to reside parallel to the unity.exe in the Unity's install directory. Uh, you can actually uh, set up a, if we can go back to the uh, stage right. Um, you can tell, uh, you, can, you can register a handler for the event that gets thrown by the, uh, the .NET, uh, by, by the, um, the resolution uh, mechanism for finding those DLLs. And you have to register that um, in a, let me, let me open this up uh, rather. So you need to, to uh, set that up before a, any reference to that other DLL. Otherwise, it happens too late, and Unity won't be able to find it. 